Tom here from Warren Systems and Unify has released version 7.023 of the Unify Network Controller. Now, the upgrade from 5 to 6 was rough because, well, it was easy to tell. There was a new update kind of frequently to fix a lot of little bugs when they made a major version change. The good news is from version 6055, the version we were on, to the 7023, which is final release, there was actually, if you're wondering why it starts at 7023 instead of 7.0, they go through the 7 series with a few release candidates prior. Then 7023 is when they decided it was stable enough to release. So it went through some testing. There were bugs. They were fixed. And for us, the upgrades have gone really well. We updated our controller, our primary one that we manage with a lot of our clients. We have a lot of client controllers to update and things like that, too. That's a little bit separate. But it went quite well. Uh, we only have a single unified dream machine not deployed at a client. So we updated that. Uh, we don't recommend unified dream machines or deploy them actively at clients we manage. We do have people who contract us who we consult with who use them. So we are familiar with the dream machines. Um, and that's the only thing I really seen going through the forum post that where people had some problems or some dream machine scenarios and some of the situations seem to have some trouble updating. But overall, the experience has been Pretty good. I would say this was a relatively smooth update because our use case is not usually using Unify routing, as in we don't use the USGs and we aren't using Dream Machines or Dream Machine Pros or Dream Machine SEs, any of the Dream Machine line. We just use the switches and access points, and then we have different firewalls. I'm bringing this up to give a lot of context to my review. For those of you that may be looking for solutions to some of the problems, hey, head over to the Ubiquity forums. There's a lot of engagement. And yes, the Ubiquity team has been replying and helping people look for some of these issues. Now, we're going to go through a full review here of the new features in the software, at least the highlights of it. I'll leave the list so because we can't go over every little detail. I'm going to post a couple questions here, though, because there's a couple things they mentioned that I can't find. And I'm hoping you, the audience, maybe has found it because I didn't see it mentioned in the forums. We'll get to that later. And uh, yeah, let's get started with it. But first, if you'd like to learn more about me and my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, such as consulting on Unify, there's a hire us button right at the top. If you want to support this channel other ways, there's affiliate links down below to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about on this channel. Now we'll start right here and I will be leave this link down below. This is the release page. And as you've seen, we have the 7020-2122 and then release of 7023. What I don't like is the release and change notes are kind of aggregated between these different releases. And uh, I'll leave a link to this Reddit post where I consolidated all that information into a single post. That way it's not kind of scattered between fixes and releases across the 7.0 version of where we're at. Now, improve user interface settings. These are some of the things and why it's popular for people to put videos out on YouTube, such as me and Crosstalk Solutions and Hostify talking about it, all of us on here and Cody from MacTelcom. I'm sure I forgot a few people that talk about these, but they say improvements in user interface, but they don't exactly show you what they are. Don't worry, I'll show you the ones we found so far. Notice and a problem I found with the pause button. And you're probably thinking, why is there a pause button in a network software? Good question. That's, we'll get to that. Improved dashboard user interface, updated log 4J, CVE 2021 45105, because there's one more iteration that they had to update the way the log 4J libraries. Now, this is not meaning there's a vulnerability in 6055 because of the way they have it implemented. It's not vulnerable, but there was still an updated version of log 4J that was addressed by putting it into here. So that's what that means for those of you wondering. It doesn't mean 6055 has some flaw, update now, go into full panic. Just to clear that up. Limits for retention settings, Unify disconnect notifications. This was something a lot of people had asked for. It was broken for a little while, I believe, or just missing. I'm trying to remember which one. We, um, I don't really use the feature. I don't have my notifications going through Unify in there, but nonetheless, that's there. Now, this is the one that I can't find. Add multi-factor multi authentication support. Now, they added support or they added the feature? Sounds like they added support because when I look at the users, I don't see it. And this was one of those little pieces of contention of where is it at? Uh, I've asked a couple of other people that know Unify and none of us seem to know where this is. Uh, so we're thinking they added support. Now, I know you can get it when you're using your Unify controller tied to the Unify account. 
but I'm not doing that. We actually have this set up, our controller specifically set up without tying it to a Unify account because it's our controller. We don't have the web interface publicly exposed. It's locked down internally and only accessible from a VPN for my office. And we don't have the intention to add our Ubiquity online accounts to it. So I'm not really sure if that's what's required of it, but when you add new users, it still doesn't have an option or even if you add an existing user, the option to add second factor authentication. But I'm not as worried because it's behind a VPN. Now, allow sorting of the uptime for clients is nice. We'll go over the interface in a moment. Allow a max of 255 networks on UDM Pro, UXG Pro, and UDM SC. This is a weird one, but allow for getting devices in the adoption failed state. This is kind of a weird bug that would pop up uh, where it just kind of gets stuck there. And uh, so now they can actually allow you to forget that kind of failed adoption of a device. That failed adoption, I believe, was more frequently caused when you had a device that was several firmware versions behind and you tried to adopt it in a new controller without updating the firmware. It may get kind of caught up in a loop. And then you would reset the device, but it would still keep trying to adopt it within the Unify controller. Uh, I always update the firmware to the latest version prior to adoption. That's just a general practice we do. And that seems to avoid the issue and probably why I've not run into it very often. But we have run into it when we do our consulting and helping people with Unify. Uh, that seems to be the cause of it but now they have the ability to get rid of it. And uh, there's a few other ones in here. This one in particular, imp implement layer three switch DHCP relay support. Now I might do a video on this because they're slowly improving it. We'll show you how they changed this. They have the ability to do some layer three functionality in a couple of their switches, but it's very limited and not really, I don't think the implementation is great. So my recommendation when people say I need layer three in a switch is not to use Unify. That's just not one of their features. Like it's an add-in. They kind of have it that checks the box, but the actual implementation of it's not great. They've now added something that a lot of people might like is DHCP relaying for the ability to do that and which might help the situation some depending on your configuration, but it's just not as advanced as some of the more expensive switches. So this is one of those, they're coming along with a feature, but it's just to me, not as well implemented. I'm not sure why. And it's a limited number of switches at all that support this layer three interlan VLAN uh, and static route adding that you can do to a switch. Not even all the switches. It's only like, I think two models or three models right now. There's not many of them. Now, because the question comes up and has come up the last few times I've done this, I've not shown the Unify controller software on our Unify demo dream machine that we have in the office. So I felt I'd start there because they did do a lot of feature changes to the dream machine. Now, I'm not saying I hate the dream machine. I have a video and maybe I'll do another one for 2022 to add the more models they've made to talk about whether or not the dream machine is the right product for you. The reason I say that is it comes down to features. A lot of people buy it with hopes it will do more than it can do. Now, if it has the feature sets you want and does the things you want, it's a good device for you. If it does not do those things such as, and even though this is on the new unified dream machine and a made updates to the way the VPN works. The right away, the thing I'd like to point out is that the VPN server supports L2P. And the only way you can do any type of VPN server with open VPN is when you're doing a custom like site to site VPN. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me why they wouldn't have open VPN with a user VPN being able as part of what's in here. It just one of those weird things that Unify has chose to kind of omit. Now, I've heard rumors that maybe one day there'll be WireGuard in here. We're not there right now. So here we are with this and has L2TP, which is inadequate for a lot of people. And of course, those of you that are looking for more advanced policy routing, privacy VPNs and everything else. Yeah, this is not where you're going to find integration for those in there. FYI, and this is probably one of the most biggest confusing points that people have. Just assuming a modern reasonable price router like this would have those features as some of the other competitors in the market space do. But let's talk about things that it does do. And this is interesting. The traffic management. Now, I only have one puzzle with this. I did some testing and we set up a block. They did a nice way of doing this. So we can look at apps, app groups, domain name, IP address, internet, local network. We want to block or allow something specific. You can say an app. You can type in something here like, you know, Facebook, Instagram. And then you can say select a device, all devices, a network, or a single computer. Now we'll cancel this here and look at the one we have set up already. Now, 
here we've blocked Facebook, Tumblr, Twitch, and YouTube, specifically for our Win 10 lab system. It's actually the only computer on here. And I wanted to test this blocking feature to see if it worked. And, and we'll go here and we see a little pause button next to it. They actually added these little pause buttons in a lot of places. We'll talk more about them as we go through. But you can stop the pause it or unpause it and it blocks those sites. Really simple to do. That's it. Click the pause and we can allow it or you can set schedules to this. You have a scheduling option. I think this is pretty cool with the one exception. And that's this right here. Facebook seems to be unblockable in Chrome, but things like YouTube are. So I've got YouTube blocked. So if we try to go to YouTube, oops, try and click on it from even a search link, it's gonna fail. It's gonna spin. We can click on it. It just, even the sublinks and music and other sections of YouTube, it just doesn't work. But Facebook seems to be unblockable except this is one I said, well, let's try a different browser. And yes, I have turned the DNS uh, over HTTPS on and off, but Microsoft Edge, for whatever reason, does block Facebook when the block is turned on. It's only Chrome that doesn't. Uh, so I didn't test everything in there, but it was kind of a curiosity because I know a lot of people ask, you know, how well does the blocking work? But it blocks it in Edge and it doesn't block it here. It's also unusual to me because if we open up the command line, and we're going to just go ahead and ping book.com. Whoops, we got to spell Facebook right. And when we ping Facebook, we get Facebook's IP address. So it's not just DNS sync calling it, but I thought I'd mention it, that it seems to be able to block these things with the exception of Facebook and Chrome. So it works. It's pretty cool. Now back over to looking at the dashboard in here and the main dashboard we have all the traffic stats and then we can go here like the traffic inspector they have now like all this looks pretty nice but one of the complaints i've had and it looks nice and this is what gets people excited is we have this entire nice looking dashboard where we can say oh look http traffic and we can dive in to this except that's as far as it goes there's very little granular data in here it kind of gives you very generalized uh, data it doesn't give you good time slicing so you can see which applications by which client were used when um, i mean there's kind of ways to pivot through it by doing this like here's some identified traffic up and down for this particular device so we've done some microsoft office traffic 423 megs it was probably just downloading updates but i can't click on these i can't tell you from what time period this was for. So this is still a feature that's kind of there to get you some ideas, but doesn't really tell you all the details you need to make intelligent decisions. Like how much data to use over what time period is a feature they really should have, time slicing in here. But nonetheless, that is all working. Now there's not much topology in here. This like I said is our unified demo machine. So let's go over to our network and talk about some of the more large scale features uh, that we see in here. They still do this, which puzzles me. We have the network version 7023. Then it says Linux 9804758. That's uh, my Chrome version. So it says Linux, it is running on a Linux server, but it's actually pulling this information out of my browser. So Linux 9804758 is my browser uh, that it sees when it's here. So I think that's strange that it does that still, but it's nice You see things like most active clients and we can see just kind of at a glance on this dashboard and they've just done a lot. This is all the new UI, by the way, to make this dashboard a lot more useful, being able to sort by Wi-Fi experience, by IP addresses, connection. They made it very fluid. I actually am starting to like the new dashboard. Uh, they also have right here, because you can adjust, filter for different things, change the columns around. Do we want to show the Mac addresses, the interfaces, the Wi-Fi band, uptime, channel, TX rate, just nice and then filtering do we want to filter for something specific in here or just let them all in here showing all devices and i like that they have these right here so if we want to know where this device is wired to we can click on it okay this is at lab rack 10g there's the model there's the insights for the rack get right to the settings mouse over them all but this is one thing i wish they had in the new ui was the ability like you do in the old ui to pop these out so you can move them around when you want to have two switches next to each other um, but I don't think it's too big of a deal. It's a personal preference. I liked when they had it. I don't know why they didn't include it here. Because if you open up different switches, you don't get to stack them like you did before. So you can make easy comparison between two switches. But nonetheless, it does work. And here it is. Now, other things they've done in the new UIs made the Wi-Fi insights look really nice. This is something I'm going to say just did a nice job on. It's uh, cleaned it up a lot. And once again, you can click on it and you can go right to the device that it's connected to, 
see the number of clients, performance. It seems to work quite well. Now, traffic stats, I don't have in here that we'd have to go back over to the Unified Dream Machine because we're not using any of the routing. But like I said, the traffic stats are still lacking time slices in the same way. So they're, yeah, of limited value, as I said. But back over to here, the devices, everything's nice, clean on the interface here for how it's displayed. It's probably moving over on the screen if you're wondering why I just don't have this slid over. I got it zoomed in to make it easier for people to see this. But yeah, uptime can be sorted usage down and same thing you get the options here display options columns pick and choose what you want to have inside of here now we're going to go over here to settings and this is where things get a little weird because they've added a pause button the problem with the pause button in my opinion is it's not pause now but i just click it and it immediately pauses that network now in the circumstance that we're using it right here on wi-fi if we pause a wi-fi network it will pause and then it just goes and reconfigures that Wi-Fi essentially not to broadcast anymore. But if we go over here to networks and I do something like look at the IoT insecure network port tap uh, ponage network, I can pause it. That actually didn't do anything at all. And the other problem is uh, the only confirmation we got that it was paused is a little slide out window over here that says you've resumed or unpaused it. So you can pause and stop these networks. And if you're not using Unify routing, it doesn't pause that network in any meaningful way. It pauses it, but it doesn't matter because it's all, as you can see, VLAN only. And it won't let you pause the main LAN. But where this can be confusing is where people set things up and maybe not realize they click the pause button because there's no like warning coming up when you do this. And this could create possibly a little bit of confusion uh, along there without having the confirmation. I already seen a request in the Unify forums asking for a confirmation to be added so that when you hit this pause button, it would do a confirm and be very implicitly understanding that you have paused or unpaused something on there. Of note, you can still switch back to the old interface and this doesn't exist. So if you pause it in a new interface, you'll break something and you can't see it from the old interface. Just an FYI on that. Now, internet not populated for ours, neither is VPN because, well, we're not using any Unify routing. Firewall and security, nothing really I'm going to talk about there. This is the same thing. You get it when you're inside of here, system, firewall and security, because this is one of the Unify routing systems. But I didn't see anything in here that was uh, groundbreaking or changing or anything like that. Now, down to the system, this is where the last few features are in here. So we'll go over to the system. And this is where you'll switch back now. You see there was a separate user interface and you enable or disable the new interface. Now you click on enable and deactivate to switch between the interfaces if you wanna go back to this interface, which still works. This is perfectly fine. The topology map is the older one that you have in here. The devices and the functionality is much the same. It's not really anything changed here. It's the one you're used to. But I don't really think the need anymore to go between the networks and set things up is what it used to be in here. Because now the features that are here, and we're going to actually go back to user interface, and we're going to go back to new user interface, apply changes. It actually switches back and forth way smoother too. That's something of note. Then we go over here and we look at Wi-Fi and we look back over here. Seems like pretty much all the features are here including the ability to do the Wi-Fi scheduling. I feel like that was missing in the 6 Series in the new UI, but it seems to be here. So I don't know that there's any reason to jump back and forth between the new and old UI. Now, one last thing I'm going to mention is improve Wi-Fi man signal mapper latency between when roaming between access points. Well, Wi-Fi Man, the app that you can load on your Apple or Android phone, got a big update, and it has a cool feature here. Euro can make a map with it, and their augmented reality tools on there. This is really neat, actually. I was just wandering around my house. I was able to go through and kind of make a heat map, and it uses the augmented reality to try to understand where you're moving within the room and generate a heat map so you can find some of the dead spots, map them out, look at it, and then maybe reconfigure your Wi-Fi or move things around to you get the most optimal or add more Wi-Fi to get a more optimal Wi-Fi experience. I thought it was partly unusual that it was in here, but it does have an integration with Unify because it can talk to something like the Dream Machine to give you more information. But if you don't have a Dream Machine, you don't have one of the routing devices, you can still use it because, well, that's how I used it here at my house to wander around and get this done. Now, as I said in the beginning, this 
overall, this update has gone well. I like seeing the new features that Unify has added to it. I still would love to see them add some better VPN features to their routing equipment and maybe some better WAN load balancing policy routing options and some more advanced features. It's just software because someone may already have pointed out in the comments before getting this far in the video that didn't you know, Tom, you can get into the back end of these systems and start modifying the config files and make these features happen. Yes, I am aware. I am also aware that when you do updates frequently, those, well, changes you've made to the back end of the system may not survive firmware updates and updates from Unify. So they're not always the best idea to do because, well, it's fun. It's a fun project. It's just not something I can deploy to clients. It's not something that's stable. It requires tweaking, but it also proves a point that these devices are capable of these extra features. It's just a matter of getting Ubiquity to write the software to allow the device to do it. So um, I think people should keep plugging away at it because maybe if they see enough community action on something like that, the people at Ubiquity goes, you know, we should just code that in there. It would be really helpful for people and make our popular uh, products even more popular. So I don't know. Um, and maybe get me to recommend them. But like I said, the shortcomings they have are my big challenge. If you just need routing and you just want really simple application blocking, like I mentioned, uh, those two functionalities for the Unified Dream Machine, as we pointed out, seem to work pretty well with the exception of Chrome getting around the Facebook block magically. But it blocks all the other sites I've blocked and tested. I didn't exhaustively test everything in that list, but so far it seems to work with the Facebook exception. But don't worry, just tell people to use um, the Edge browser. Well, actually, don't tell anyone to use Edge browser. Sorry about that. Someone's going to flame me in the comments for it. I, I prefer Chrome or Firefox. Actually, I didn't have Firefox loaded on it to see if it blocked it in Firefox. Uh, I don't know. If there's enough requests, maybe some quick demo video I'll do on that. But I don't know if I'm really curious enough. It's not something we actively deploy. And it could easily be fixed. There could be some extra thing added by Unify through some update or through some feed update uh, that just makes that problem go away. It's kind of a weird one for sure. All right, and thanks. Everything I mentioned will be linked down below. And thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. If you've enjoyed the content, please give us a thumbs up. If you would like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. If you'd like to hire a short project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there's a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thanks again for watching and look forward to hearing from you.